Welcome to Shat on TV Lovecraft Country, the unofficial podcast companion piece to the new HBO series Lovecraft Country. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ashley Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And the unassailable King B. Bring on the tentacles. And this is our series preview episode where we dive deep into the cast, production, and background of Lovecraft Country to calibrate our expectations of HBO's biggest summer offering. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss an episode. And you can do that wherever you get your podcasts or by visiting chatontv.com slash subscribe. And we'll have an instant reaction live stream every Sunday night on Twitch. So you can find that at chatontv.com slash Twitch as soon as the episode of Lovecraft Country has aired. Now, this season, we are going to make a pledge to you, the listeners, and there are four things that we promise. One, if you listen to this podcast, we will keep it tight. We won't go over the show scene by scene. We'll tie together the big ideas to bring you insights worth talking about and improve your viewing experience. Two, we will hear you. Audience participation is a huge part of Shad on TV, and conversation is always humming on Twitter, YouTube, email, voicemail, and Discord. 5,000 minds are smarter than one, and you, the listeners, make us better as hosts. Three, we will not spoil the show. Each podcast episode will only talk about what we just saw, not what we might know is coming. Now, Ash and I have read the book, as have many of the listeners, but that's only to prepare for the show. It's not to predict the show. And finally, four, we will explore Lovecraft Country. We're not going to play TV critics. You subscribe to a TV podcast because you like the show. There's no point in wasting your time talking about what we loved or what we hated. Sure, we're human. Opinions come through, but the vast majority of the weekly deep dive will be spent exploring what we just saw on screen, what it means, and why it matters. Now, on our Sunday night Instacast, all bets are off. It's like uh, it's like if I discovered a cave, I might yell out, hey, King B, check out this amazing rock formation. And I go, yeah, I've seen rocks before. What of it? Now, Ash, this is the second full season of a podcast we've done together, and the work really hasn't stopped since we did Westworld earlier in 2020. I got to know, what made you to come back for Shad on TV and do Lovecraft Country? So I really loved the experience that I got to have with you and Big D when we did Westworld together. Uh, Little did we know when we talked about me joining you in February that we would start amidst a pandemic and it became, you know, a really good experience. And this may sound like lip service, but um, I pretty much would have done any show that you guys wanted to do again, because I had so much fun with Westworld. And I thought that it was such a great process. And we produced what I thought was a pretty, a pretty good podcast series. But I have to say, I am glad that this isn't just some random show that it's this specific show. uh, Because I think that this is going to be a pretty special television kind of event for us to end out our summers and to start our falls. Uh, As we talked on the preview pod, this is a horror story slash sci-fi story. And Shat hasn't done real horror before in terms of TV. And so it's a new thing. It's a new genre. Horror is by far my favorite genre. And so I'm kind of all in for exploring this alongside you guys. And just to add to that, this story is we're going to kind of unpack uh, in the time that we kind of find ourselves in and the national conversations we're having about racism and systemic racism and the structures that support that and keep those systems in place. I don't think we could have a more perfect story coming to us. And I think this is going to be fun. I think it's going to be scary. And I also think we're going to have a chance to dive into some really cool conversations as well. Having stepped up to the plate in all of our chat, uh, let's call them the B team offerings, doing uh, True Detective and uh, American Gods, I'm finally excited to be kind of on the front lines for what I'm going to consider like the more premium content. I never did the Game of Thrones or Westworld shows very much. I'm really excited to kind of be on the front lines for this show. Uh, There's really nothing else going on in TV right now that's worth getting excited about, in my opinion. I'm looking forward to another premium HBO offering as opposed to the stuff we've kind of been suffering through lately. 
Now, Lovecraft Country will air on Sundays starting August 16th on HBO, and we're doing things a little bit differently this season. So you'll still get your deep dive uh, powered by Ashley's incredible research and the King Bee's astonishing insights, but that's going to come out on Wednesdays this season. So we have a little more time to rewatch, digest the episode, edit, and hear from the audience. And we also have new ways to hear from the audience this season. So you can still email us at hostshatontv.com. You can leave a voicemail at 914-719-SHAT, but now you can also join us on Sundays immediately after Lovecraft Country airs for a live discussion on Twitch. It's totally free to use, and you get to see our beautiful faces. There you can share your thoughts and hear our thoughts, and then your insights will ultimately influence the deep dive that comes out on Wednesdays. As for your email and voicemail, we'll still post letters to chatontv.com under the Lovecraft Country section. And Ashley will respond to those on the website. We also will read select letters during the deep dive and during Shappy Hour, which is our Friday night Twitch stream cocktail party. If you don't want your letter read and you just want us to see it, that's fine. Just note that in your email and we will honor it. If you're listening at this point, you probably know what Lovecraft Country is about, but maybe you're just trusting us because we are Shat and you're saying, fuck it, I'm along for the ride. So the summary that's offered by most news sites in HBO I think is kind of off the mark, right? So HBO says Lovecraft Country is about a cross-country road trip in 1950s Jim Crow America to find a missing father. That's not wrong, but it's just the beginning of the story. Like there's so much more tale to tell. Some chat listeners who have read Lovecraft Country knowing we were going to do the podcast have responded to us saying this book feels like it's all over the place or not one linear story. But uh, Lovecraft Country actor Michael K. Williams, who plays Omar in The Wire, uh, he says the show's like The Twilight Zone. And considering that executive producer Jordan Peele did The Twilight Zone reboot and Monkey Pra Productions is behind The Twilight Zone and Lovecraft Country, I think that a Twilight Zone type show is kind of a natural fit for this audience. And much like The Twilight Zone is sort of a TV parallel to what we might get in Lovecraft Country. The Oscar-winning film, The Green Book, uh, has also been tied to this series. Now, I haven't seen it, but I heard that The Green Book is horribly overrated. And I do plan to watch it before Lovecraft Country debuts just to get a better idea of what this book is all about. Uh, The Green Book, for those that don't know, is this travel guide that outlines safe or dangerous places for black motorists in Jim Crow America. And it plays a huge role in Lovecraft Country. Ash, do you think it's worth watching to understand what Lovecraft Country is all about? I don't. I, I'm definitely in the camp that thought that the Green Book was was really overrated. As much as I love Mahershala Ali, I think he's wonderful. And I love Viggo Mortensen. The movie itself, I think, is kind of it's kind of subpar. I, I really think that if you want to truly get your knowledge ready for a book that is similar, that is a huge kind of plot line within the the book, and we are assuming it's going to be in the show, I think you probably could just go to Wikipedia and look up the actual Green Book and read what it was. And I think that probably would would be enough to prep you for the show. Yeah, I'm going to back up Ash's statement here and say that if you just get some historical context on on the title of the Green Book and really what that's about, you're going to be a lot more moved than if you spend two hours listening to Viggo Mortensen go, hey, I'm from New York and I don't like the black guys so much, but maybe I will someday. Who knows? It's painful. But when I did watch it, learning the existence of this part of history that I would never learn about otherwise was fascinating and it's a moving thing and it, it's absolutely something you should open your eyes to. Don't give that movie, movie a second thought. Note to self, don't watch The Green Book. Do watch Lovecraft Country and subscribe to Shat on TV, Lovecraft Country. Sounds like you got it all figured out. <laughs> Another thing you should know about Lovecraft Country is unlike other HBO series, it gets more than halfway through the book in the first five episodes. How do we know? Well, HBO did a really bizarre thing that they've never done for us during Game of Thrones coverage, during Westworld coverage. They actually released the episode titles and the descriptions for the plot for the first five episodes. Now, we're not going to read them here because spoilers aplenty, But you should know, dear listener, that the pace seems to indicate we're going to get all the way through the whole book in the 10 episodes of season one. 
I'm wondering if maybe we need to prepare ourselves that this is going to be kind of a one-off, a limited series like The Watchmen was. You know, when we went into that, we knew that we only had a guarantee of one season. And it looks like even with the copious amounts of Emmy nominations they've received, that they're still going to stick to only one season. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I almost prefer that. I'm a huge fan of like BBC, like British television, where they do, you know, one, two, three seasons with just a couple episodes each season, because I think it gives them more time to really focus on the plot and end before it gets kind of tiresome, like the last season of Game of Thrones, for instance. And so I think that this, this I think, is a, a good sign to us that maybe Jordan Peele and J.J. Abrams are in for one season. And I, I don't know about y'all, but that's going to make me really pay attention and try to enjoy every episode even more because we don't have that promise of, of what's to come. Now, I think that's a real bummer. Uh, I was a big fan of Watchmen being one season, but there's so much to explore here. Lovecraft Country as a novel does not spend a lot of time with any particular character. And there are a lot of events that could be explored more deeply through a sustained series. This is one of those rare occasions where I actually wish that the thing would drag out longer. And I was shocked to see how far they're going to get in this season one. One bright spot is that there is a singular showrunner who is involved in the writing of every episode. And that's Misha Green. She created Underground in 2016. If you haven't seen it, it's another 10 episode anthology, at least season one is, that deals with a slave escape attempt in 1850s Georgia. But much like Lovecraft Country, it tells the story through several different viewpoints. And it is not necessarily a straight linear shot as most TV we're used to. I think we're almost looking at a new genre of TV uh, or entertainment storytelling in these sort of prestige format miniseries or just one and done seasons. You know, in comic books, they have the prestige format trade paperbacks where they just come out to tell you one story that they don't want to divide into 28 page issues. They've just got one message they want to get out there. And I think that this is a great format. I don't know anything about the book. All I know is what I've seen from the trailer, which is all over the place. You've got some really amazing, strange visuals that seem anachronistic and maybe uh, otherworldly at times. And all these things are coming together. It keeps bringing my mind back to that movie Cloud Atlas, where you've got several different stories completely unrelated to each other that all have common elements that tie them together throughout time. The notion of Lovecraftian horror being this sort of outside of time and space malevolent force affecting men's minds and and their lives, it just seems to make sense that you've got 10 whole episodes to tell this really long weaving story that's going to cover time and space. I love it. I hope there is no second season. I hope they do a great job on this and they never come back to it and they start new projects. Now, we mentioned earlier that Jordan Peele is an executive producer of the show. And while Twilight Zone wasn't necessarily a masterpiece, Peele's two big films, Get Out and Us, undeniably changed the horror genre. And I think we're strong evidence of his ability to tackle serious subjects outside of sketch comedy. I mean, absolutely. I'm a huge fan of both of those movies. And I think that what's so interesting about Jordan Peele is he's got this unique way to tell a story. Um, He crafts a narrative where he lets us as an audience both relate to what's happening and then starkly see the difference between us and what's on screen. And we kind of get to see from a different perspective, like the whole thing with double consciousness. He plays with that really, really interestingly throughout both uh, Get Out and and us. And so I think that a story like Lovecraft Country, at least reading the source material, somebody like him that is able to paint the picture of differences and the consequences that people pay both for labeling people as different and the price you pay for being labeled as different. I think that this story lends itself really well to his type of storytelling. And it's definitely in the, you know, the genre of stories that he seems to like to tell. So I, I have really high hopes for him and being involved in his foray into another type of television other than the Twilight Zone. Now, J.J. Abrams is a much more mixed bag for me. 
I can't say that I like most of his movies, but his TV track record is pretty solid. So Bad Robot, as a production company, has a solid string of programs. I'm a big fan of Lost. Uh, I know that Fringe has a strong cult audience and is well thought out. Alias, I thought, was fantastic. And of course, the Shad on TV audience is aggressively pro-Westworld. Yeah, I, I'm also a big J.J. Abrams fan, if I'm, I'm being really honest. I, I think that what's great is you've got Jordan Peele, who's crafting these narratives through the story, and you've got J.J. Abrams, who's so good in television, in creating a world that looks like our own, but has, interestingly, like slight differences. Um, Fringe is a great example of that. It's set in our real world, but is different. Alias is another really great example of that. I know that this may lose me some respect, but I'm a big fan of Lost. It's one of my favorite shows ever. I even liked the ending. I was fine with it. I, I thought that it was okay. And so I'm I, I loved it. And alias, I agree with Eugene. It's my my favorite spy show ever. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And so I think JJ Abrams is good. I think that he combined with Jordan Peele, I think that's going to be a pretty big force to be reckoned with, you know, for us to get to see perhaps really good TV. It's only your favorite spy show because you haven't watched Patriot. Um, Actually, you a few years ago, like two years ago, told me to watch Patriot and I did watch Patriot and I liked Patriot a lot, but I still think Alias is a better show. Fair enough. Listen, J.J. Abrams is the first guy who could ever make me give a shit about a Star Trek movie, and he made one good Cloverfield movie. So I'm excited to see what he's got next. One final note on the production before we get to the cast, which Ashley has done extensive research on, is where this show was filmed. Now, if you haven't seen the stills or the trailers for Lovecraft Country, do yourself a favor and watch this TV show. This vision of 1954 America, the use of color, the sets, the costuming, the quality of the camera work, it is just absolutely beautiful. The show was shot in Chicago, also shot in White Pines State Park in Illinois, and in Macon, Georgia. And yeah, there is quite a bit of green screen work, which has me a little nervous, but the non monster parts look absolutely spectacular. You're right. I think the cinematography and the trailer looks actually really beautiful, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And if all of what Gene just talked about with the production is not enough to kind of entice you to want to maybe give the show a chance, I think the cast may do it because they've set up a really, really fantastic group of actors, both known and unknown, which I find really exciting to kind of tell the story. And so we want to kind of break those down for you. And the first is what I would call the the lead of this series. It's certainly the individual that the book spends the most amount of time on. And that is the character of Atticus Black. And that is being played by Jonathan Majors. Now, in doing research, uh, I wasn't familiar with the name of who Jonathan Majors was, but you probably have seen him before if you've seen some of the more buzzy films in the past few years. He's kind of new to acting, but he was in uh, White Boy Rick. He was in Defy Bloods. And he was in what I thought was fantastic, the docudrama that Dustin Lance Black did called When We Rise. Atticus is arguably the most charismatic and well-written character of the book. And so he's got big shoes to fill. But in what I've seen of Majors, I think that he's got that charisma to to pull it off. Now, I, I will be very honest, when I was reading, and I think we're all guilty of this, that we all kind of put a picture in our mind of, you know, who it's going to look like. And I was reading, understanding that this was going to be a TV series, and maybe it was the Jordan Peele effect. But when I was reading, I pictured Daniel uh, Kaluuya from Get Out the the lead of that uh, movie. And I think he's amazing. And so I have to get him out of my head and replace him with majors. And so I'm crossing my fingers that he's going to be as good as I think Daniel would have, have been in this role. Ash, in reading the book, I thought that Jonathan Majors looks exactly how I pictured Atticus in my head. Uh, TV shows rarely take the step of making a character intersectional, right? They make them very two-dimensional and they're just one thing or another. This guy is black, a veteran, a book lover, a son, and a man living in Jim Crow America. That adds so many dimensions that make me incredibly excited to see him on screen. 
You know, I've seen Jonathan Majors in three films, uh, Captive State and White Boy Rick. Both were kind of forgettable. White Boy Rick's just terrible. But uh, Hostiles, he was uh, in Hostiles as well. Hostiles is the only one that I feel is worth mentioning. And unfortunately, Jonathan Majors is only in supporting roles uh, in everything I've seen him in up to this point. I look at that guy and I'm going to get weird. Like that guy cuts a fine figure, like wearing that little T-shirt and just guys in great shape. He's very handsome. He's an interesting person to look at. I'm looking forward to seeing that guy take the lead and be the forefront of the show rather than just another supporting character. So the next character that we want to talk about is another huge role. And I think she's just a fantastic character. And the character's name is Letitia Dandridge, and she is being played by Journey Smullett. Uh, Journey's an actress that you probably have seen before. She has been in a lot of things. She was on True Blood, so she's got some HBO experience there. She played the title character of Eve's Bayou, which was an award-winning film. She originated the character of Black Canary in the DC Universe, Birds of Prey. She was on Friday Night Lights. She was way back in the day on Hanging with Mr. Cooper. She's been around for a really, really long time. She unfortunately most recently has been most famous for being the sister of the star that that kind of fell from grace, Empire's Jesse Smollett, who famously had that did he or didn't he get attacked in 2019. But I'm excited to see her kind of moving beyond that with a really big leading turn with this role. Uh, Letitia is a huge character, I would say as big as Atticus is. She's really fun. She's really spicy. She's really, um, she's got some really great lines. She wears some great fashion. I think she's going to be really fun to watch. She's going to have a lot of fun with this role. Yeah, Ash, every new show seems to have that it character that transcends the narrative and works her way into pop culture as a standalone personality to be celebrated. So like, even if you haven't watched Lovecraft Country, don't know what it's all about, you've seen gifs or photos or memes, and there's just this face, this attitude, this look of a show. I really think that Journey Smollett is that actor and Letitia is that fun and exciting character that will emerge as the face of Lovecraft Country, uh, despite perhaps not being the main protagonist. And she's just a really likable character. Um, The next character is not quite as likable, but he's a great character and being played by one of my favorite television actors. The character is Montrose Freeman, who plays, uh, basically Montrose is Atticus's father. And so in the synopsis of a son goes on search for a father, it's going to be Montrose that's being, you know, looked for in the, the opening of this show. And Montrose is being played by Michael Kenneth Williams. And if that name doesn't mean anything to you, he is Omar from The Wire. Omar, I was obsessed with when I watched The Wire. He has always been one of my favorite television characters ever of any show. And I think Michael Kenneth Williams is just a force to be reckoned with in these large supporting roles. And Montrose is going to be another role for him. Um, Other things that Michael Kenneth Williams has done, he was Albert Chalky White in Boardwalk Empire. Also, he was in the HBO biopic Bessie. He played Bessie Smith's husband, got a lot of critical acclaim for that role. And just he's all around an amazing actor. And I'm really excited to see him take on this role of Montrose because you were talking about the kind of multidimensional nature of Atticus's character. I think that Montrose is equally as complex. He's a really complex character. And if anybody can pull off those different dimensions, it's going to be a veteran like Michael Kenneth Williams. Now, in multiple interviews and panels, the cast of Lovecraft Country has said it is set in 1954, but the politics, the issues that are being explored are incredibly relevant today and perhaps even advanced to the point of 2020. Montrose verges on militant in his distaste for racism. So he is really capturing the zeitgeist of today. I love him as a character for that. Now that's going to give Michael Kenneth Williams a lot of room to bring back that Omar hostility or maybe that that chalky savviness. And I look forward to that. I also want to point out though, that Michael Kenneth Williams played a sort of militant black leader 
in the purge anarchy and it was laughably bad just know that this guy isn't above slumming it for a paycheck so fingers crossed but i'm wincing a little bit if you can't wait to see michael tackle these more complex race issues you really need to check out the three season run of happen leonard it was a uh, run on sundance tv Michael plays a gay black Vietnam veteran Republican in 1980s East Texas. His best friend was an ex-hippie conscientious objector played by James Purefoy. The two of them travel around East Texas in the 80s, solving crimes and getting into all sorts of hijinks. It's a fantastic show about two best friends that have no business being friends. The King Bee has literally watched everything on TV. (laughs) And I hated most of it. Well, the next guy has literally been in everything on television, and that is Courtney B. Vance. Courtney B. Vance is playing the character of George Black. Uh, George is Montrose's brother, and he is Atticus's uncle. He has a very large role to play in in this story. Uh, For Vance, Vance, like I said, he's been in everything. He's a TV staple. He was in The Closer. He was in Law & Order Criminal Intent. He was in the miniseries The People vs. O.J. Simpson. I mean, his IMDb page goes on and on and on. Um, He also is a Tony Award winning actor. He's been in lots of movies. I did not know he was in The Hunt for Red October, but apparently he was. Uh, The Disney version of Huck Finn, Isle of Dogs, Terminator Genesis. Again, the list goes on and on. So this is a veteran TV actor that I'm excited to see kind of elevate from network TV to doing something on HBO that hopefully is going to be a really good way for him to, you know, continue his very lengthy acting career. Now, Ash, we've received some questions in advance of the TV series Lovecraft Country about whether we'll be spending much time on the podcast comparing the book to the TV show. And the answer is, other than this preview episode, probably not. But one thing I found very interesting is that some of the characters do have their last names shifted. So if you are a reader of the book or you're just curious about it. In the show, we have Blacks and we have Freemans as surnames. Now, in the book, we had Turners and Berries. If that ends up being something significant, we'll be happy to go into it. Uh, Just a little thing that I found interesting. So the next actor is going to be playing a character by the name of Ruby Dandridge. Uh, Letitia's sister is Ruby. And Ruby, we don't want to give anything away, but she's got, whoever plays this role has got a big challenge because of how, I know we've used the co- the word complex, so let's not use that. It, it just has a huge hurdle to overcome in telling what is a really difficult story that Ruby has. And Ruby is being played by an actress by the name of Wunmi Mosaku. And Mosaku is a Nigerian-born British actress. She's been all over BBC shows and one of my favorite BBC shows, uh, Luther. She is apparently going to have a very large role in the Disney Plus series Loki that will be coming out next year. Her film credits, she was in Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Philomena. I don't, I have to be very honest, I don't remember her in a lot of those movies, but I looked her up and you were talking about how Atticus kind of matched what you pictured. When I saw her, I went, oh my God, she looks identical to what I pictured Ruby looking like. So I am really excited about this casting. Ash, you might not remember her from Fantastic Beasts because I think she was like a typist, like she worked in the typing core or something like that. So it also was a terrible movie. But I liked it. But uh, but but yeah, I agree that Mosaku is dead on Ruby. I feel like Ruby is going to be one of the more controversial characters in the series. Unlike Atticus, I had the hardest time hearing her voice in my head when I was reading the novel. She's such a strange and unique character that I couldn't quite imagine what she would sound like. So the idea of an experienced black actress giving Ruby that voice is beyond exciting for me. So the next actress that's going to be coming on the scene here is Ingenue Ellis, and she is playing Hippolyta Black, the wife of George Black. 
Now, Ellis is an actor that has been working for a long time. She's got a really impressive resume. She had a huge scene-stealing role in The Help. She's the maid that asks uh, for the loan so both of her twins can go to college because they only have the money for one to go. When she doesn't get it, she steals the ring and is arrested. I mean, she does a wonderful job with the few scenes she had. She also acted in the absolutely fantastic If Beale Street Could Talk. She's great in the Ava Du Renee miniseries when they see us. So she's been in a lot of stuff. And this woman can act. And I've never seen her with a lead role, but always these very important uh, supporting roles. And Hippolyta is that kind of character. I think she's going to do a great job with her. And I hope that because she is so good, I'm hoping she's one of those characters that they give her a little bit more to chew on, a little bit more to do than the book does, because she's a great character. And this is a great actress that's playing her. Now, Ash, I've seen absolutely zero of the performances you just mentioned, but I do agree that Hippolyta is a tremendous character. I wouldn't mind spending an episode or more getting to know. This is one of those areas where I think that that TV can take us beyond the books and really flesh out this fascinating person that I feel I haven't gotten to know yet. We've kind of talked very positively so far about all the actors that are playing these roles. The next one is the only one that I'm feeling a little uneasy, I guess we'll call it, about. And that is Abby Lee. Abby Lee is playing a character by the name of Christina Braithwaite. And I'm going to have trouble this season pronouncing this character as Braithwaite because I am from New Orleans. In New Orleans, this is Braithway. And Jean had to correct me before we even started recording. So I've got to get it. But it's Christina Braithwaite. And the reason why I'm feeling uneasy is two reasons. The first is that Lee is completely unknown. She's an Australian model. She's absolutely gorgeous, but she's a model and she had a role where she just kind of stood there and was beautiful in Mad Max Fury Road. And that's pretty much all that I could find on her. She has a couple little sprinklings here and there, but nothing that's as potentially star turning as this. And the reason why this makes me nervous is because the character that she is playing is a really crucial character in this story. And we'll get into the next section about why this character is so important, but just know that I'm very surprised they're giving it to such an unknown actress. Now, the King B and I spent a lot of time in the chat on TV minor leagues covering American Gods. And fuck, I'm getting some American Gods vibes here because when Ricky Whittle was tapped to play Shadow, we're like, all right, underwear model, maybe he'll make it work. Trusting a big role to a model almost never works out. I'm not saying that models can't act. It's just a huge gamble for such a big show. I agree, Ash makes me super nervous. I don't know. She's not that bad in her four lines of dialogue in Fury Road. I bet she did. I bet she really surprises you. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. After all, it is a Lovecraft story, so maybe we get lucky and she turns into a cosmic voiceless tentacle and it all works out. I hope so. But the the next person and the last actor that we're going to talk about in the last role is somebody who definitely has proven themselves in ways that Abby Lee has not. And that is Tony Goldwyn. Tony Goldwyn is playing Christina's father, Samuel Braithwaite. Um, And Tony Goldwyn, if you don't recognize his name, I promise you, you recognize his face if you're over the age of 25, 27. Um, Everybody knows this dude that's in that age bracket. Uh, He was in the Pelican Brief. He absolutely terrified me as a kid in the movie Ghost. He was the animated Tarzan, and he did a great job as that for Disney. He was President Bitch on Scandal. The dude's a staple of TV and film. And this role, I think, is going to be really fun for him because Samuel Braithwaite, not to give anything away, is bad, bad news. And Goldwyn, he really plays bad pretty well. Ash, you and I read books so differently because I pictured Samuel Braithwaite more like Christopher Lee's Saruman from Lord of the Rings. I thought he was like this long, white-haired wizard with like a staff and a very sharp nose. I feel like my world is crumbling right now. See, this is the Southern in me because I pictured him in a seersucker suit, sipping mint juleps when he goes into the house with like just a tinge of an accent, which is why it was Samuel Braithwaite in my head and not Samuel. And you reminded me this takes place in the Northeast. But for me, he's a Southern, Southern gentleman. So 
Nah, he lives alone atop a tower. That's that. I just can't get past Ash assuming that everyone would recognize him from Ghost and Pelican Brief. Can you stop watching movies my mom couldn't get halfway through because she was too drunk on boxed wine? What are you doing? Whatever. Ghost is a great fucking movie. It was like, like, uh, where do I start? It's so old and goofy at this point. It's been lampooned so many times. I, I, I Why are we still talking about Ghost? I have a cold heart, but Unchained Melody melts it every time, so... One of the last things that we wanted to do was just talk briefly kind of about our hopes um, with regard to the book versus the show. And like Jean said, we're not going to go through and say, well, this was the book and this is the show. But just having read the book, looking you know, forward to the show, what would we like to see and what would we maybe like to see changed? The first thing is that we're going to get to spend a bit more time with the characters. And I know that we talked in the beginning about how already we're halfway through the book with five episodes, but there's a lot that they can do with scripts. And Misha Green, Underground is fantastic if you haven't seen it. She does a great script. And so I'm hoping that we kind of get to know not even the characters more as much as their points of view more. What is motivating them more? Why do they have the complexities that they have. And the big one for me, my big hope is that that gets done for Atticus uh, specifically. Now, Ash, a lot like Game of Thrones, Lovecraft Country is written from multiple points of view. And typically you have those broken down by chapter. It's very hard for a writer in a novel to show us multiple points of view uh, in one continuous narrative in a single chapter, right? Now, TV though has the capability to do that, right? The camera angle can show us what another person is seeing in the same moment. And so I'm hoping that they take advantage of that technology of the shift in medium to be able to show us multiple viewpoints of the same thing at once. I think also that the accelerated pace of the show will have characters back on screen before you have time to miss them. I do feel like they're filtering a lot out Uh, which will allow us to focus on maybe fewer characters than we did in the novel. And that could be a good thing. I I completely agree. And and that kind of leads into the second thing, us seeing more of the characters, but also maybe getting a chance to see the monsters. So we kind of alluded at the beginning that the synopsis does not really encapsulate what the entire book is about. And we talked about how it's an amalgam of sci-fi and horror. And if you've watched the trailer, you see kind of this glimpse of one of the, the monsters. And I am hoping we get to see some of these badass creatures that they describe in the books. But there is one particular monster that I'm super nervous about them recreating on film because if they don't do it correctly, it's going to go horribly wrong and truly could do like derail the entire series if it's cheesy. But I'm going to just, you know, sit back and say, okay, they've got to have it. HBO has done amazing things before. They made the dragons look really good by the time Game of Thrones had been on for a while. And then with Watchmen, they made a blue do with a giant blue dick work without a laugh. So if they're able to do those things, then I really am kind of holding out hope that they can do it here too. One thing Lovecraft Country does well as a novel is let our imaginations figure out monsters that would be really hard to justify in the real world. And that is, I think, an homage to Lovecraft himself. But I agree, Ash. I do not envy the special effects team on this one. They have a huge job ahead of them. And the other person that has a huge job ahead of them, again, is Abby Lee. I feel like we're picking on this poor girl before we even see her. But with regard to the differences between the book and the movie, the the biggest difference that I am concerned about is the fact that Caleb Braithwaite is now Christina Braithwaite. And I have no problem with the gender swap. I think that that's perfectly fine. But there are Also is this new character that they're introducing named William that we know is close to her in some way. And from what I've read, they've kind of broken Caleb up into the two of them. So Christina isn't just a total gender swap of Caleb. She's just a piece of who Caleb was. And I'm curious to see how that changes character storylines, particularly a character like Ruby. Um, I don't know who you pictured Caleb as if Samuel was Sauron, um, but I pictured him as a young man in a seersucker suit with a mint julep that drives a beautiful car. And I think Christina could pull off a beautiful seersucker suit, but if she's not fully Caleb, um, I 
don't really know. And I'm anxious to see it, but I am a little concerned about how they're going to take such a magnetic character and kind of break him up into piecemeal like they seem to be doing. I imagine Caleb as that actor that the King Bee absolutely hates with the fire of a thousand suns. Which one? Ansel Elgore. Ansel, Ansel! Yeah. See, do I know King Bee or what? Yeah. Baby driver. I'll fucking fight that dude. I fucking hate Ansel Elgort. Fucking mush mouth, dead eyed. F- fuck. Ah! Well, I was shocked, Ash, when you told me this news. Caleb is probably my favorite character in the entire novel. He is magnetic. I can only hope that this swap makes things more interesting. Now, Abby Lee in an interview described Christina as, quote, an agent of chaos, which is something we've been seeing a lot of in TV and film. I'm looking at you, all Nolan movies. Not to pick on her, but this could be a make or break decision for this TV show. Yeah, a lot's riding on her very tiny Australian shoulders. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, so, I'm, Gene, just to be clear, when you imagine a magnetic character, you think of Ansel Elgort? No, you have to be able to like hate his face and he has to present mm-hmm. white privilege. So, and be beautiful. I mean, an Ansel Elgort is a beautiful man. I don't know, man. He's kind of dead eyed, isn't he? There's more beautiful young white dudes out there than him. Well, Paul Newman died, so. <sighs> yeah, but they got the CGIs, right? <laughs> anyway, moving on. Well, and the final thing that I wanted to talk about with regard to kind of hopes is me personally, and this is just coming from me, I'm I'm hoping that there's more horror and maybe a little less sci-fi than the book has. Um, I am of the mind that the book itself is a little confused about what genre it finds itself in. Um, it doesn't straddle the line clear enough to be a mix of sci-fi and horror, in my opinion. It's way too confusing as to which the author is intending for it to be. And I'm hoping that they move more toward the horror end because I think that the story itself lends itself more to horror than it does to sci-fi. And I'm hoping that with Jordan Peele involved, that they can play up as much of the horror as possible. Because I would like to see just a fucking scary, gory TV show that teaches us something. I think that would be That would be enough for me. I agree with you, Ash. And I love a mix of both sci-fi and horror. I think movies like Event Horizon, video games like Dead Space that combine sci-fi and horror are exciting and creepy. And what's great about them is horror feels old. Horror feels like it's in the past. Horror feels antiquated sometimes. But when you mix in that sci-fi, you can rewrite all the rules. And that's cool. Real quick, Gene, I've got to call you out. Are you really going to ignore Alien as the greatest horror movie? Granted, it's a sci-fi setting and it's mostly a sci-fi movie. But honestly, I think the two genres work so well. You've got the meat of the thing inside whatever carries it. So it's always horror, in my mind, set in a sci-fi setting where sci-fi really just takes the back seat. I haven't read the book and I don't know anything about it. But I do know a little bit about how these Lovecraftian monsters do their business. And it's always this weird cosmic entity in outer space coming to Earth to dick around. Unless we've got actual time machines and laser guns showing up, is it really a sci-fi story? Yeah, I I totally agree with you. But that's where the book itself is confusing is there are these two major chapters that are very staunchly sci-fi. Like they are sci-fi chapters. And then the rest is horror. Like you're saying, horror bundled up in sci-fi. And I think it's really interesting you bring up Event Horizon, Gene, because I actually just watched that the other day because my husband had never seen it. And that is a perfect example about a horror movie that is set, like you're saying, be in a sci-fi setting. And that would be, I hope that it ends better than Event Horizon does. But, you know, that would be a great way to kind of set this up. And there's nothing on TV right now that is horror bundled up in a beautiful sci-fi tentacled fucked up monster that we're all being served once a week and i'm i'm down for it now we begin the agonizing wait until august 16th when hbo reveals the monster it's been cooking up be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend we're on twitter snapchat and instagram at chat on tv 
On Facebook, just search for Shad on TV Podcasts. The website is shadontv.com. You can email us at hosts at shadontv.com or leave us a voicemail at 914-719-SHAT. You can also join us on Twitch at shadontv.com slash Twitch. And you don't have to wait for Lovecraft Country to do that. We have programming Tuesday through Friday, including our Shappy Hour every Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, the King B doing Getting By with the King B playing State of Decay 2 and giving you survival advice. That's Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. We also have our squad goals where you can play video games with all of us. Uh, that's at 9.30 p.m. every Wednesday. And the Untitled Florida Men Project, which is on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Also, check out our sister podcast, Shat the Movies, where our friends Roger Roper and Dick Ebert cover 80s and 90s movies commissioned by you, the listeners, you can find past and future episodes at www.shatthemovies.com and wherever where fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please review. That helps the podcast grow now more than ever, guys. We are a brand new podcast doing Lovecraft Country. It stands apart from everything else we've done. Your reviews will help people make the decision to subscribe to us because they trust it because you trust it. On behalf of my co-host, Ashley Schlafly, and the King B, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us on August 16th on Twitch immediately after you watch the debut episode of Lovecraft Country. We can't wait to discuss it with you. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay the fuck at home. Earnestly tell us about the J.J. Abrams things that you've liked. He did Felicity. <laughs> uh, she cut her hair. It was a big deal in my childhood. I got it. I'm sorry. Hold on. Star Wars, Star Trek. God, you know what? Maybe I don't give a shit about this guy. <laughs>